with that, we'll start our workshop. Um, our first speaker is Tim Palmer. Tim is a professor at the University of Oxford and a visiting fellow at ECMWF has <laughs> spent many, many years thinking about this problem. So and Tim doesn't need an introduction to this group. Tim, yeah, whenever you're ready, you can share the screen. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for the uh, invitation to talk um, today. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> okay, can you see my, um, can you hear me? And yeah, can you see can. my screen? Yeah. Yes, Tim, yeah. Good. Okay, so, uh, I'll explain this character on the front in a few minutes, but um, I guess I, the theme of my talk is really uh, how well could we do in this area of, of seasonal and sub-seasonal prediction? What's our aspiration? Um, and um, oops, see now. okay, good. Um, let me just explain this slide. Let me just start by by noting that we've had a pretty strange year weather-wise. Um, in fact, not only year, summer, um, the extraordinary temperatures uh, that were reached in British Columbia. And I mean, nobody would have expected 49.5 degrees Celsius in British Columbia, uh, but that's what was uh, observed. Then we had the, the devastating floods in, in Germany and Belgium and parts of Europe. And then shortly after that, I'm sure we all saw the pictures of people being flooded on the subway trains in uh, Henan province in China. And um, I don't know about the US, but certainly in the UK, um, I think there's been a kind of, a, even, even amongst the, the, the media that's quite climate, skeptic i would say there's been a an acceptance that we're seeing something extraordinary here something that that just goes way way beyond the normal and there's a there's a kind of a, a growing acceptance that this could well be a manifestation of climate change even people that have been previously reluctant to think about that and so then the question arises um well okay what what do we do about it i mean there are two issues one we have to try to cut emissions to stop these things getting worse. But then there's a realization that we have to also try to adapt to the new normal, try to make society more resilient um, to changing extremes of climate. And this was a report from the Commission on Adaptation a couple of years ago, where they highlighted a number of options um, for climate adaptation. Um, you can see going down the list, there's the, the uh, fourth one is protecting mangroves. This could be what's often called nature-based solutions, trying to use nature to, um, in this case, help reduce the risk of, of dangerous storm surges by getting the mangroves to damp some of those storm surges. The second one is the conventional kind of technology engineering approach. Can we build new infrastructure to make society more resilient? Um, but the top ones, the reason for showing this is, is that they highlighted strengthening early warning systems as one of the really key um, issues to make society more resilient. So strengthening early warning systems, you know, should be seen these days as part of the more general climate adaptation program. Um, and not only that, the report um, tried to estimate a, a benefit cost ratio in these different areas. And you'll see that strengthening early warning systems um, has a benefit to cost ratio exceeding 10 to 1. It, it's the only one of those five that has such a high benefit cost ratio. So I'm starting this, you know, making the point that what we're doing in seasonal to subseasonal, we may think of it as somewhat detached from the climate problem, but I think it's going to increasingly play a crucial role in getting society better um, prepared for extremes of climate, whether it's droughts or floods or extreme temperatures or whatever. So I just want to put the work that we do in this area into that context. And in fact, there have been a number of really, I think, important and exciting developments in, literally in the last year or two on how um, 
society is actually making use of our forecasts. Um, it's always been frustrating, I'm sure, to, to everybody to, um, you know, uh, well, or see on the news, if you don't experience it directly, but see, at least see on the news that a major event hits an area, could be a, it could be a, a tropical cyclone or it could be a, um, a continuing drought. And it's only really when things have got really bad or after the event has hit that the emergency res services start acting. And, you know, what's frustrating to us is why didn't they act sooner and why didn't they make use of the forecasts? Um, and this is starting to happen now. Um, the, I think a lot of the pioneering work has been done by the Red Cross, Red Crescent Society um, in a scheme that they call forecast based finance using um, the forecasts on different timescales from medium range up to seasonal um, to provide aid in the way of financing to local regions at risk of severe and intense weather. And now this UN Office on Coordinating Humanitarian Action is making this a major new initiative for their, um, for their disaster preparedness and humanitarian um, work. So suddenly, I think our um, our science has has kind of gone from, um, you know, let's say of academic interest or something that um, you know we monitor in workshops and things to something that really is center stage in this whole climate resilience, climate adaptation program. And so it raises the question: Can we are we able to deliver the goods? And how how well are we doing? And I have to say, I think, you know, those of, of us who studied and indeed worked on seasonal forecasting for, for many years, um, realize it's still a bit of a mixed bag. Um, I've taken the last two northern winters as examples. Um, we had, I think, would say remarkable success in winter 2019-20 um, in the sense that the models around the world pretty much agreed on uh, seasonal forecasts for, for DJF 2020, uh, both in the tropics and, and in much of the extra tropics. Um, and as far as one can tell, this seemed to be linked to a very strong Indian Ocean dipole event that developed. There wasn't any ENSO event. Um, and in some ways, it wasn't the kind of standard paradigm of a strong ENSO where all the models agree on the ENSO response. Uh, there was no ENSO, but there seemed to be an IOD. And I think to some extent, this has taken us a bit by surprise. So it's a, it's a good result, but it wasn't as if we had this paradigm where IOD was, a, was known to be a very strong and predictable driver of, of the extra, well, of the tropics and extra tropics. Um, so we had good success there, although I would argue for reasons that I don't think we still yet fully understand. Um, Conversely, this winter, I would say things were much worse. There was an El Nino, or at least a La Nina event um, uh, in, in, in reality, but the models tended, as they went into the winter, tended to uh, significantly deepen this or, or increase this La Nina event. Um, I've, I've put three of the main operational models below. Um, and you can see, you know, the, the one on the left is really very poor indeed, uh, but they all have pretty much the same tendency of trying to overdevelop the La Nina. And then the corresponding teleconnections were poor. And I would say these were not very good forecasts. And again, this is, you know, this kind of goes slightly contrary to the normal paradigm, which is, well, you know, at least we can get El Nino and La Nina right. Uh, and we, we may still struggle with the teleconnections, but at least we can get El Nino and La Nina right. And this shows that this, this is not quite as simple as that. Um, so I think from a theoretical point of view, we still have a lot to understand. From a practical point of view, uh, as I say, it's a bit of a mixed bag. We have some very good examples, but we also have some not so good examples. Um, but sort of irrespective of that, it, I think it's it's probably fair to say that all of the actual extremes of events that I, I mentioned, the, the, the extreme heat uh, on the West Coast, the flooding in Europe and, and in China, the actual magnitudes of these events are way outside the range of what current 
um, seasonal forecasts or indeed sub-seasonal or, or for that matter probably medium range as well we're talking about events which models really struggle in a, in a big way to predict and that's of course a major problem if you want to try to attribute these events to climate change because the whole attribution philosophy is based on looking at the frequency of these events uh, in runs with current co2 and with reduced co2 and if neither ensemble can simulate these events then all you get are, are the ratio of two numbers which are both zero so it's, it becomes an indeterminate um, calculation well i mean historically you know when we've tried to ask the question, how well could we do in principle, the answer has been to go back to what's called the perfect model assumption. We just assume our models are, uh, they don't have any biases or, or systematic errors. And we maybe kind of introduce small initial perturbations, which correspond to what we think are plausible estimates of uncertainty in the initial conditions. And then just look to see how far the, uh, the models diverge from each other. Um, but in recent years, I would say this itself, this sort of assumption, perfect model assumption has been called into question. And this um, article in Science magazine about a year ago um, really cast doubt on this approach. And in particular, the fact that current models may significantly be underestimating um, potential predictability. Um, this actually goes to um, a problem that um, was was highlighted by the Met Office um, some years ago. Um, perhaps the paper E. et al. is the is the is the most known one, and focusing on the uh, North Atlantic Oscillation. And the result that they found was that when they um, uh, this is over a number of years in the 19, well, the late 20th century and into the 21st century. They found that when they correlated their ensemble means against observations, they got quite high levels of skill. But when they correlated the ensemble mean against a typical ensemble member, the correlation was actually much lower. So the implication is if you if you treated um, the uh, if you if you if you were to think about a perfect model scenario where you you just take one member of the ensemble and treat that as as a potential realization of truth, you would actually underestimate very significantly, according to this result, um, the actual correlation of the of the ensemble mean against the observation, which is like three, whatever it is, three over three times higher. Um, and the, yeah, the ratio of those two numbers is a thing called the RPC ratio of predictable components. Um, well, we, we've, we've done a, a, a certain amount of work on this in Oxford. Um, one thing I'm not going to talk about, but I just sort of say, in, in passing that um, we believe that this this uh, property if you like of of the models and the atmosphere has some decadal variability and that this high value of the rpc in other words the under estimation of predictability from the perfect model potential predictability can actually vary from one uh, multi-decadal period to to another um and an amateur weissheim has done I think important work on this showing um, that in the mid-century, for example, that, that that there wasn't this underestimation. Um, but again, going back to the early 20th century, there was again. So what's going on here? Um, because this is, I would say this is quite important. Um, as I say, if we're wanting to try to estimate how well we can do in principle. Because if our if our you know, perfect model assumptions are, are just misleading us. Um, we need to understand why. Um, and the hypothesis that we've been working on in Oxford is that it's related to, um, if you like, systematic errors in the nonlinear structure of these models, uh, which, which would manifest itself even when you're doing a perfect model um, 
kind of predictability experiment. And the idea is that in the real world, we have um, circulation uh, patterns that, that have a kind of regime structure. They have a certain persistent structure due to nonlinear uh, dynamical effects. But these are poorly, and, and part of these nonlinear, well, we'll come on to this, but part of these nonlinear structures are, are, are associated with scale interactions between high, high and low frequencies and small scales and large scales. But the models um, underestimate that and they end up having these rather shallower, broader um, regime structures. So you can think, if you like, of you know, the real world rattling around in a, in a sort of rather deep potential well, where the ensemble members are rattling around in this much broader, shallower potential well. And as a result of that, the ensemble members have much too much spread compared to what they should do if they were rattling around in a deeper potential well. Um, although this work was focused very much on mid-latitude circulation regimes, I think there's a kind of generic issue here, which, um, which I would sort of just like to point out that, that um, you know, this is, this is a, a kind of deficiency in nonlinear structures in, in in climate models. And I just fairly uh, randomly sort of showing you a, a, a paper pointing out that there's also ENSO regime structure. If you if you run ENSO models or look at ENSO variability over long time periods, you can see regime structures there as well. Uh, I mean, one simple example is the fact that, that we have more of these Modoki El, El Ninos in recent years than we had in the past. And this may be a different type of and so regime. Um, um, Christian Stroman, who's, uh, who's in my group in Oxford, uh, and I wrote a paper in the QJ trying to analyze this problem from a kind of Markov chain point of view. So in this case, NAO, we're thinking of the North Atlantic Oscillation in its two phases as two regimes. And in this Markov chain model, we just, um, we model the variation in um, well, we, we, we model the atmosphere as, as a kind of random uh, jump between these two regimes where there's a, an intrinsic probability from one day to the next of staying in a regime that could be alpha for NaO minus or beta for NaO plus, uh, and then a one minus that probability for making a transition. And then we would model different years by different values of alpha and beta. So there'd be kind of interannual variability in alpha and beta. And then we would model the, the fact that the climate models are deficient in simulating the persistence and the, the persistence of the regimes or the depth of that potential well um, with, a, with a parameter which would systematically weaken the persistence um, uh, probabilities alpha and beta. Uh, and with that Markov model and a particular, we have this parameter K, which is this deficiency in in the alpha and beta and with a particular value of k we can almost identically um, simulate these correlations that were seen in the met office seasonal forecast model so i think it it it's well i think at least it's a plausible uh, explanation for this problem so then the question is, how do you improve the regime structures? How do you improve these nonlinear structures in our climate models? Um, and let me just show you is a really interesting result uh, and a sort of counterintuitive result um, from uh, the Lorentz 63 model. Uh, sorry, the, so the top, the top slide, this is from Josh Dorrington as a student of mine. In Oxford, or I have to say, this result was first uh, uh, published by Frank Kwasniok from Exeter. So this is just a replication of what uh, Kwasniok had done previously. So if you take the Lorentz 63 time series, it, it oscillates chaotically and unpredictably between the two regimes. If you add noise to the system, you might think, you know, it would kind of destroy the regime. It would just kind of smear out the regime structure, and you just get a, a kind of a mushy mess. But actually, for a range of noise values, it does 
completely the opposite. It it um, it it leads to much more persistent uh, regimes, much stronger regime structure, which is very exciting. I mean, it's a it's an interesting non-linear effect of noise. It's one of these examples where your intuition, if if it was based on linear thinking, would be completely wrong. So um, minutes, that's your 10 minute warning. I don't know if you could. Oh, hear. OK. All right, then I need to rush. Um, no, you so, don't need to rush. You just uh, you have 10 minutes list. OK, left, including right. questions. OK. Oh, including questions. The 10 minutes, including questions. Yeah. So if you could, yeah, maybe five minutes and then five minutes. Okay. Question answers. All right. So um, we I did some work with Andrew Dawson, who who's now at ECMWF in the so-called Athena project, uh, looking at this regime, we did find evidence that um, this is going from T, T511, the, the, the second to the third point is with adding stochastic parameterization, which did actually help regimes. Um, the biggest uh, effect though was that resolution was the biggest thing that would improve regime structure. And um, since that day, there've been a couple of papers, since that time, there've been a couple of papers um, by by a number of us in Oxford and, and in Italy and elsewhere, um, actually confirming that regime structures are improved with resolution. The the evidence with the stochastic noise is actually I, I would say much less clear at the moment, and it's not it's not quite clear to me why we're not seeing the the big impact we saw in Lorentz sixty three. But if I've only got five minutes, I don't have time to talk about that. Okay, so. Um, so what, why, what sort of level of resolution should we go to? And I think we, we need to think big here, because once we get to one kilometer resolution, then we can completely get rid of parameterizations of deep convection, orographic gravity waves and ocean eddies. And we're beginning to do this. Uh, this is the Max Planck icon model for the ocean at one kilometer across the North Atlantic. And we, we're kind of seeing remarkable uh, eddy structures that you just wouldn't see um, at uh, at, at the typical resolutions we have now. Um, I think I'm going to miss this point, but one thing we don't need, however, is high precision. And we've been doing a lot of work on uh, 32 and now even 16 bit precision. And, and I, I'm not going to talk about this paper, but we, we've, uh, it'll appear in QJ, hopefully, uh, QJ, Journal of Climate, Journal of Climate, shortly. Um, doing El Nino experiments at 16-bit precision with the speedy model. And the results are almost identical to the 64-bit version. Um, and um, certainly in Europe, there are, the, the EU is now investing a lot of money in developing a, a one-kilometer climate model coupled to societal impact models in, through what they're calling a digital twin of planet Earth. Um, one thing that we're still trying to um, lobby for is that we need computing, supercomputing that, that is commensurate with that sort of ambition. And this is actually the latest CERN Courier, the High Energy Physics Center, which has an opinion piece from myself and Bjorn Stevens um, making the case for a, a CERN for climate change, uh, at least an exos a dedicated exascale computing center. These projects will not succeed without the support of the community. Um, this is why I put this slide, because it it, it needs your help to, to take this forward. Um, all right, so I, I'm, I'm going to stop. And then if there are any comments or questions, I'll be happy. But, you know, we have made great strides uh, in operational seasonal sub seasonal prediction in the last, you know, 20 plus years. Um, but we're still at the mercy of model inaccuracies, biases, the sorts of problems with the nonlinear structure of regimes and so on that I mentioned. We can't wait for another 20, 25 years to sort this out. Um, we need reliable predictions to help society become more resilient to changes in climate. This is becoming, I think, an urgent problem. And just sort of um, saying, oh, well, you know, we will eventually it'll all get sorted out, I don't think is, is good enough. Um, some modest investment in dedicated exascale computing for, for climate and seasonal forecasting could really be revolutionary. And, you know, in terms of what we spend on space based observations or on other things, or even CERN, if you like, this is not really a very amount, large amount of money. 
but it needs the community support uh, to to make this happen because if we don't speak with one voice, then it won't happen. Um, so I feel passionately that you know seasonal forecasting is really crucially important for society in the future, but we're not there yet at the level of reliability uh, that we need to really drive these anticipatory action projects of the Red Cross and the UN humanitarian aid organizations. We need to, we need to step up another gear to, to take us to that level where we're really providing society with important and valuable information. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Tim. Are there any questions for Tim? Maybe I can start with one um, while we wait for questions on the chat. Um, so when you mentioned about the potential well and the difference in the potential well with the stochastic noise, I was wondering, has anyone done experiments where you increase the resolution of a model, um, maybe the Lorentz 96 model, and um, it's hard to visualize the regimes of the potential well there, but how does increasing the resolution compare to uh, adding stochastic noise in terms of the different behaviors in the potential well? Um, well, the, the, okay, uh, I'm not sure on Lorentz 96. Josh, my student, has done work with the Charney devore model, okay. um, which also shows exactly the same uh, behavior that if you increase, so I should say Charney devore is just um, a th three component model which has multiple equilibria. But as has been shown by uh, Deswart and others over the years, if you in, you can you can increase the number of degrees of freedom uh, to make it chaotic, uh, this is a barotropic vorticity equation, um, and it shows exactly the same behaviour that if you add noise, it stabilises the regimes that will correspond to zonal and blocked flow in exactly the same way. Um, what Josh has tried to do is look to see if you increase the number of modes in the charney devore model whether that has the same effect or, or even more effect so that would be the increased resolution type of thing yeah. um i think the answer is it it's not it's not that straightforward it doesn't uh, he, he doesn't have any kind of clear-cut results on that yet but i i would just make the point that when we talk about resolution there actually are two different things going on. Um, one is that, I mean, resolution of a, of, a, of a climate model. One is that you, by increasing resolution, you're better resolving the topography uh, of the model. And, the, and that's got nothing to do with stochastic physics. That's just the lower boundary forcing. Um, the other is the improvement in the transient eddy forcing, the scale interaction. And that probably is, the the bit that the stochastic forcing is is kind of um trying to um, mimic in some way uh, in, a, in a kind of poor man's lower resolution ensemble um i think most of the results from the papers of um th that i that i highlighted um just now are suggesting that probably um the resolution the, sorry the topography issue is is probably the one that is dominating in, in terms of improving regime structure. Um, so if that's the case, it, it could potentially explain why we're not seeing quite such an impact with stochastic physics. Um, but I think, to be honest, the jury's out. I mean, I feel that the parameterizations of stochastic physics are still fairly crude, and it may be that we're just not, uh, we're not just not doing it properly yet. I don't know. Yeah. So it's an interesting research question, I think, for the future. Great, thanks, Tim. Zain, you have a question on the chat. Would you like to unmute and ask? Sure. Um, I think it's pretty related to Anisha's question, so you can answer briefly. But I was wondering if this issue with underpredicting potential predictability, if you see sort of resolution as the, I guess you you know you're saying it's one promising path forward, but are there other? And this you sort of just addressed this, but are there other things in model development that we might do? aside from just going to higher resolution to sort of, you know, address these, these issues of maybe regimes not being as predictable as they should be? Um, well, I, I don't know. I mean, the Met Office themselves have done quite a lot of work exploring different possibilities. 
and they haven't actually really identified you know within a within their cu current model framework they, they really didn't identify anything that would improve um the this uh, rpc diagnostic um so and i think their latest you know well I, latest maybe it's a, a year old now but they 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 also had some indications that that resolution was going to improve um they looked again at some eddy transient eddy statistics which suggested that was that was the case um so again i don't know um I don't, I mean, it would be an interesting experiment if, if people had the computer time, it would be an interesting experiment to run the, I mean, I'd love to see this done, to run the, to run the high resolution model with low resolution topography. In other words, keep, keep the topography at your low resolution, just increase. Does that improve the regimes or is it actually the, the topography? I mean, that, that's still, I think, an open question. Um, and that's why I think maybe the stochasticity alone, I mean, if topography is important, then the stochasticity alone is not going to, is not going to do it. Um, but apart from that, no, I don't know. And, and as I say, there was a paper, I think by Adam Scaife, where they went through a lot of different experiments that they tried with different changes in parameterizations and um, boundary forcing and sea ice and all that sort of stuff. And none of it really impacted at all on this RPC diagnostic. Great. Thanks, Tim. There's a question from Shui in the chat. Would you be okay to reply on the chat for that? Oh. We, are, we are two minutes into the next time slot. Oh, okay. Okay. Thanks okay. again, Tim, for a yeah, really great talk. And thanks for the question, okay. Zane right. and Shui. Thank you.